Coming up, the latest from Terry Knight and the Dreams. Now, for all of you out there who are just coming out of comas, they'll be kicking off their cross-country Dreamland tour this very night right here in the Mile High City, baby. Now, as promised, here's Terry Knight and Remember Me. Remember me I long to be your favorite memory Remember me And all the time You're kidding. That's incredible. Uh-huh. Hang on, I see what she says. All three shows in L.A. are sold out. Sam Eagles thinks if we had a show up front, he could sell it out, too. What do you say? Do whatever you want. Sam. Yeah, she's all for it. Okay. I'll fax you an amended contract. Uh-huh. No, no, no. Thank you. Yeah, see you next month. Sam says break leg. Come on, Terry. It's okay. Remember the last tour? Oh, you were so nervous. But once you got out there and started to sing, well, you brought the house down. It'll be that way tonight. The show will be over before you know it. Remember Perry Mason, my law school professor? He called me this morning. Hey, he's in town to give a uh, guest lecture tonight. Says he can't come to the concert, but he'll try to make the party after. Come on, honey. The show is as tight as a drum. Try to relax. You're going to be great. I got your monitors all wrong. I'll be right back. Hey, Frank! Terry, hi. How you doing? Sean, I thought you were in London. I just flew in. You didn't think I'd miss your opening night, did you? Jack told you, didn't he? Told me what? That I'm changing labels. You flew in just to beg me to stay with Pacifica. Terry. We go back too many years. I don't deserve that. Yeah, you do. Hi. How you feeling? Where's Carla? She's here. She's downstairs. Well, go get her. What are you doing? Uh, this mic keeps shorting out. Well, what do we need stand mics for? To record the show. Well, who told you to record the show? You did. When? Last month. You said you thought it was time for you to do a live album. That is a lie, and you know it. What is the matter, Andy? Business a little slow lately? You're running behind in your BMW payments? Terry. Are we just desperate for an excuse to see me again? Pull these mics and get out of here. Give me a check on uh, 436 okay? Sorry to keep you waiting. Let's get this over with. Now, everyone, just stop. This spotlight is blinding me. I can't hear myself sing, and what I can hear sounds like Ted Max Amateur Hour. Terry. Take it easy. We'll get everything adjusted, and we'll just take it from the top. Like hell we will. All right, move that light. Come on, guys. Adjust these monitors the way they should be. Come on, move it. Becky. Becky. Get my jacket, please. Becky. What the hell is he doing here? He says you invited him. Why the hell would I want my ex-husband here? Get my jacket and hurry up. They're fixing everything. It's going to sound great this time. Come on, let's go back. 
Forget it. Terry, it's just a sound check. The sooner you go back in there, the sooner it'll be over. What are you doing? Blowing this two-bit pop stand. Look, let's go into your dressing room. You can tell me what's wrong, okay? Will you stop treating me like a child. Oh, stop acting like one. You're getting pretty good at bossing people around, aren't you, Jack? You like getting whatever you want from whomever you like, don't you? Stop it, Terry. You know, you know how many people would pay attention to you if it wasn't for me, Jack? No one. Zip. You'd be nothing without me. This isn't the time or place. Now you get it together. We got a show to put on hey, here. Hey, hey, Back hey. off. You and all these other parasites put the show on. Me, I am gone. Oh, Jack. She says she's not doing the show. It's just nerves. What? Don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. Jack, you know where she went? Probably the apartment. I'll have her back within an hour. Hey, maybe somebody get else. Get out of my me. way. my husband comes in, don't let him in. Uh, just a minute there, Mr. Barnett. Your wife said I wasn't to let you up. My wife doesn't know what she's talking about. Uh, maybe if you just get out of my way. What's wrong with you? You're trying to get back at me for Corrine, aren't you? Aren't you? I told you it was over four months ago. Now, I'm sorry it was a mistake. It will never happen again. Oh, liar! You don't do that concert. Okay, you'll be hurting me, but you'll be destroying yourself. I'm bleeding. Oh, I'm sorry, I really am. Sweetheart, you're just not thinking. All right, I'll do your concert. You're just tired. You've been tossing and turning beside me at night for weeks now. It's just your nerves. You're going to be great tonight. Look, to hell with the sound check. Why don't you just lie down for an hour or two? Uh, I left my throat spray at the office. I'll get it. You just try and get some rest. Take my car. I love you.
emergency assistance. Yeah, listen, I live in an apartment at 1793 Terrace Drive, and there's a real bad fight going on upstairs in the penthouse. I think you better send the police or something. Uh, what do you mean a fight? Hey, all I know is a man and a woman are yelling at each other. There's a lot of banging and scuffling going on. 1793 Terrace Drive? Right, the penthouse. And your name is? Look, just send the cops, okay? You've got to have a permit to park here. Didn't you see the sign? I guess I missed it. Well, you've got to move on. I'm expecting company. We got a call that there was some kind of disturbance up here. Well, my wife and I had a rather loud argument, I'm afraid, but it's over now. Oh, where is she? My wife, she's taking a nap. I'm afraid we're going to have to wake her up. Look, my wife has a concert tonight. She needs her rest. As soon as we're sure she's okay, we'll be on our way. I don't want her disturbed. Nan? Nan? Charlie, in here! You don't have to give us a statement. You do understand it. I'm an attorney. I understand it perfectly. All right. Then tell us about the fight you had with your wife. She was about to go on tour, starting with a concert here at the auditorium. She was going to have to go out there and sing in front of practically everyone she'd known since she was born. She was terrified. He was her husband. He should have understood that. Instead, he gets into a fight with her, and right there in the green room, it, it was awful. Did he hit her? No, but he grabbed her and shook her real hard. And then she said she wasn't going to do the concert and just turned around and left. I went to our penthouse thinking I could calm her down talk some sense into her. But all she wanted to do was fight. She started throwing things, clawing at me. That would happen to your face and hands? She was out of control. Finally, I slapped her. How many times? Just once. She settled down and the fight was over. Thank you very much, Mr. Leo. Lieutenant. Yo. Preliminary coroner's report indicates she was killed by a single bullet to the head while she was lying down. No powder burns, nothing to indicate suicide. Cold-blooded murder. She was alive when I left to drive to the office. Someone must have come in and killed her while I was gone. Only two people entered the building before the police showed up. Ms. Knight and her husband, Mr. Barnett. Anyone leave the building before the police came? Nobody went by the front desk. And a TV camera lets me see every car that goes in and out through the garage. Nobody left. Not even Mr. Barnett? No, sir. I looked in the bedroom when I got back. The drapes were drawn. It looked like she was asleep. Mr. Barnett, I'm going to be placing you under arrest for the crime of murder. Before we go any further, I want you to read this gentleman's rights. Lieutenant Brock, that won't be necessary. I'll inform my client of his rights. I'd say you can consider this interview over now. Would you excuse us? All right, Mr. Mason. The stuff and let's get right in here. I'm sorry, Jack. I didn't think you'd get here so soon. Thanks for coming. I got the word. I came right away. It's a good thing, too. Of all people, you should know better than to make a statement without counsel. I just wasn't thinking. It doesn't look good, Perry. Last time I saw you and Terry, you both seemed very happy. She 
changed. Started picking fights. Arguing about the most inconsequential things. Acting distracted, remote. Was your marriage in trouble? About six months ago, I was, uh, well, I was indiscreet. A woman I met in New York. It was a short, stupid affair, which I regretted immediately. Felt so bad about it, I told Terry. How did she take it? Oh, she was pretty angry at first. But she said she forgave me, and I thought that was that. All right, Jack. What happened today? Well, we uh, got into a fight over at the auditorium during rehearsal. She left and went to the apartment we have here. I followed. We fought some more. Then we made up. I went out to run an errand. Twenty minutes later, she was dead. Someone must have come in and killed her while I was gone. Where did you go when you left? To the office. I had to pick up her uh, throat spray. It was a prescription. Anybody at the office see you? It's Saturday. No one was there. But you got the throat spray. No, unfortunately, I couldn't find it. The DA is going to contend you never went anywhere. I know. Perry, I loved her. I didn't kill her. I know you would never ask, but it's important to me that you know that. Jack, I didn't have to ask. But thank you for telling me. I'll try to get you a rain first thing in the morning. I take it bail won't be a problem. No. All right. Let's get to work. Well, Lieutenant Brock. Mr. Mason, here to have a look at the scene of the crime? If you don't mind. Mind? I'll even give you the guided tour. Make my day. Now, in here is where he shot her. As you can see, she was lying on the bed when she took the bullet. Jack didn't shoot her, Lieutenant. Right. Now, well, back out here is where we found the murder weapon. 25 caliber handgun. Thank you, Prince. Just know that the registered owner, Mr. Jack Barnett. Now, over here is where she threw the ashtray at him. Must have been some fight they had. Looking for Perry Mason? Here, Ken. Mr. Malansky. I talked to everyone who lives in the apartments below this one. Nobody heard any fighting and nobody called 911. You mean nobody will admit they called 911? It happens all the time. Nobody wants to get involved. Let's go, Ken. That 911 uh, call, could you have a tape of that delivered to us uh, soon? Yeah, listen, I live in an apartment at 1793 Terrace Drive, and there's a real bad fight going on upstairs in the penthouse. I think you better send the police or something. Uh, what do you mean a fight? Hey, all I know is a man and a woman yeah, are yelling at each other. There's a lot Did of... Did you hear that? Uh, go back a little. I think you better send the police or something. Uh, what do you mean a fight? Hey, That's all it. I know is a man hear that and horn? Are yelling at... That's a car horn, Perry. A very loud car horn. The fight this caller says he overheard took place in a penthouse on the 24th floor. So if he heard the fight from, let's say, the 20th floor and he made the phone call from there, that horn is still awfully loud. Hey, all I know is a man and a woman are yelling at each other. There's a lot of banging and scuffling going on. 1793 Terrace Drive? Right, the penthouse. And your name is? Look, just send the cops. Maybe the caller was using a cordless phone. Maybe it was a car phone. Maybe he wasn't in the apartment building at all. In that case, the person we just heard could have been the killer. Calling the police to make sure you got blamed for the murder. You're saying, uh, he watched me leave, went up, killed Terry, and then went back outside and called the police when he saw me come home? Well, since you drove, he had to position himself where he could see the entrance to the garage. So, there's a chance somebody might have seen him. I'll get right on it. 
Jack, who knew that you and Terry were going to the apartment that afternoon? Everybody overheard the fight we had backstage. Roadies, stage hands, the backup group. Specific names. You're kidding. We could be here all day. Wait, wait. That's not true. That apartment was our Denver hideaway. Very few people knew about that. Which means that even though everybody heard me say where I was going, only a handful of people would have known where it actually was. Jack. Right. Specific names. Let's see. Uh, there was Carla Peters. She's one of the members of the backup group. She's been there, I think. And uh, Sean Lassiter. He's the president of Pacifica Records. And Joe Dillon. Terry's peach of an ex-husband. I think they were both there. And Andy Sachs. He produced most of Terry's records. And, of course, um, Terry's personal assistant, Becky DeLeo. She's been there hundreds of times. Good. We'll start with them. Yeah, hi. I'm investigating a murder. You know, the one that took place on Saturday across the street. I was just wondering if you happen to see any strange people or strange cars that afternoon. Mm -hmm. I'm investigating a murder that took place over there in that apartment building on Saturday. I was just wondering if you happened to see anyone or anything that was out of the ordinary that day. Hi, I'm investigating a murder that took place Saturday over there in that apartment building. I just wondered if you happened to see or hear anything that afternoon that was peculiar, like anyone hanging around down here on the sidewalk. Remember me? Vaguely. We met in New York about four years ago, briefly. I was his friend then, but now I'm also Jack's attorney. I've always wondered something about attorneys. What would that be? How they can live with themselves, knowing they defend guilty people for a living. Guilt or innocence is for the judge or the jury to determine. However, if you think Jack killed Terry, you're wrong. Then who did? Someone who knew Terry was going to her apartment after she left that rehearsal. Someone who knew where her apartment was. Someone like me? Perhaps. She and I were like sisters, Mr. Mason. Everybody thought... Terry was this glamorous, sophisticated superstar. But what she was really was just a kid. We'd go to Disneyland for the weekend or New York and shop, you know, buying things for everyone she knew. I think it was because coming from the ghetto, ha having to struggle every inch of the way, when she was a kid, she didn't actually get to be a kid. When did you two meet? About five years ago. In a concert in Philadelphia. I was her biggest fan. I still am. I've never known anyone so... Genuinely kind and giving. God, I'm going to miss her. Jack said she'd been pretty rough on you these past few months. She was just nervous about the tour. I understood that. Well, I see you found Becky. How are you doing? Oh, spare me the grief-stricken husband routine, Jack. I know you too damn well. We've known each other for years. I can't believe she would think I had something to do with Terry's death. Maybe she doesn't. What do you mean? It's going to be interesting to find out from Terry's will the amount of her estate and to whom she left it. Anyhow, I was wondering if you saw anything or anyone out of the ordinary that day. 
You know, as a matter of fact, my aunt had a run-in with someone kind of strange that day. What do you mean? Well, around 4 or 4.30, she saw this guy parked out front, just sitting there talking on the phone in his car. She said she finally had to go out and tell him to move. Well, can I talk to your aunt? Well, she's out of town. She won't be back till tomorrow. Well, I guess I'll come back then. Thanks a lot. Sure. This won't take very long. Well, you take just as long as you like. My niece will be home for lunch any time now, and I'm sure she'd love to see you again. You're not one of those married men who doesn't wear his wedding ring, are you, Mr. Melansky? Oh, no, I'm not married. Anyway, you, your niece was telling me you had words with somebody parked out front the day Terry Knight was killed? Well, yes. I was expecting company for dinner that evening. The Hingles, Leonard and Eleanor, and their boy Sheldon. He was on furlough from the Navy. He's my niece's age. Anyway, as you saw, it's permit parking only out front. So I had to watch for the Hingles so I could give them a temporary permit. Only when I looked out, I saw this man parked out there without a permit. So I just marched right out there and told him to move on. Well, what'd he look like? Well, uh, uh, like a construction worker or something. Big and mean, and he had a scraggly beard, and his hair was kind of mousy colored. Well, would you recognize him if you saw him again? Well, probably. Well, anyway, he drove away as soon as I talked with him. <laughs> Once he got off the phone, that is. You didn't get his license plate number, did you? Oh, good heavens, no. The make of the car? It was uh, dark blue, dirty, and banged up. I remember that. It just looked awful. Oh, yes. And it had all these stickers in the back window that said, Dorothy and the Tin Men. Who are Dorothy and the Tin Men? Well, that's just what I asked my niece when I went inside with the Hingles, and she said it was a local rock band with a girl who sings in her underwear. Sheldon didn't know that. He really wasn't very with it. Mr. Lassiter, I'm Perry Mason. Yes, of course. Uh, please. Come in. I appreciate your seeing me. I could tell you were a busy man. Just going through the motions, really. Terry's death came as a horrible shock. Please, uh, sit down. What can I do for you? This picture. When was this picture taken? Eight years ago. That was the dive Terry was performing in when I discovered her. It was just the dreams then. But it was clear she was something special. It just naturally became Terry Knight and the Dreams. Remember me, remember me. I long to be your favorite memory. Remember me and all the time. really did was make her as beautiful on the outside as she already was on the inside. She deserved every bit of the fame and fortune she got. I'll never sign anyone like her again. Ever. Jack tells me she was about to sign with another record company. In this business, that's just another way of asking for a higher royalty rate. No, she was concerned about the way your promotion people do business. I use independence to sell my recordings. What's wrong with the way they do business? Terry apparently believed you got radio stations to play your recordings by giving them illegal payoffs. What, payola? That's ridiculous. Ridiculous? 
that what you said when she confronted you? She never confronted me. Jack says she did. Well, she lied to Jack. Oh, he's lying to you. I mean, my God. The man is on trial for murder. He's liable to say anything. You'd have been ruined if Terry had gone public with her accusations. What exactly are you suggesting? I understand you had a set of pen and ink drawings custom made for her apartment here in Denver. So what? It was a gift. So, you'd been to her apartment? Yes. Look, before you start trying to tie me into the Kennedy assassination or something, let me tell you this. I made Terry Knight, and she knew it. Now, she may have thrown a tantrum or two recently, but that was just nerves. She would never have done anything to hurt me or anybody. That just wasn't her style. Seems to me her style changed. Thank you, Mr. Lasseter. I'll be in touch. in it? The owner around? Why? I uh, just hit it. <sighs> Another dent. Harry will be thrilled. He's probably in the back somewhere. Trying to get somebody to listen to that damn demo tape of his. You know, would-be songwriter. Well, we better get this over with. What's this guy Harry look like? Big guy. Sandy brown hair. Wears a suit coat over a work shirt. Real class. <laughs> Try the dressing room backstage. It's right up those stairs. Thanks. Harry? Harry? Just a little bit. Yeah. Who the hell is that? Hey, can I help you? My name's Mason. Sorry, I forgot you're coming. I'll be right in. Keep working. How's Jack doing? He's holding up. You've been producing Terry's records for how long? <sighs> Five years. Four albums. How the two of you get along? Easiest star I ever worked with. So the argument you had with her the afternoon she was murdered was a fluke. Just a misunderstanding, that's all. I had a long talk yesterday with Terry's driver. So? So. That wasn't the first misunderstanding, was it? We had an affair, if that's what you're talking about. Didn't your wife divorce you because of that affair? Wasn't there a substantial property settlement? Just about bankrupted me. And then Terry walked out on you. She never said so, but uh, I think she took up with me just to get even with Jack for messing around on her. Her heart was never really in our relationship. I knew it, but I couldn't help myself. 
I thought maybe if I loved her enough, in time, she would love me back. One day, she just refused to see me again. That was it. How did that make you feel? Like killing myself. But if you're trying to say that maybe I killed her instead, you have no idea how much I loved her. I should have known she'd never leave Jack. In the end, she just couldn't hurt Jack the way he had hurt her. She was the only truly decent human being I've ever known. But she destroyed your life. Yeah. Everything but my music. same guy. He knew that she could place him outside Terry Knight's apartment the day of the murder, so he got nervous. He came back here and he killed her. This is a burglary going south, plain and simple. Oh, come on. Some guy breaks in, he's thinking nobody's home, starts trashing the place, she sneaks up on him, he clobbers her, she winds up dead. I think that someone killed her, then trashed the place to make it look like a burglary. Thank you, Mr. Mason. Mr. Melansky, can you give me a description of your burglar, sir? I didn't get a good look at his face. <laughs> so, in other words, you have nothing. But whoever killed her also killed Terry Knight. If you'll excuse me, gentlemen. He hangs out at the L.A. club, Brock. Did you get a look at his license plate? Yeah, back at the club. I wrote it down, but it was a dead end. The car was stolen. I'm going to find that guy, Perry. Of course you will. I just want you to end up in one piece. Well, you're turning into a regular. Love soda. Love soda. 
So what did Harry say about his car? Actually, we wound up talking mostly about music. Yeah? You in the business? Yeah. I'm an A&R man from Pacifica Records. Listen to the demo Harry gave me last night. I think I could use a couple of his songs. No kidding. <laughs> Harry's gonna be famous. Maybe. If I can find him. See, I lost his phone number. Hey, Kathy, come here. This guy's a big honcho of Pacific Records. Wants Harry to write some songs for him. Hey, cool. well, actually, I just want to talk to him. You're Kathy. Kathy Redding. Hi. Harry's a friend of mine. Harry Mason. That's right. Joe Dillon. You were Terry's first husband. I was 29. She was a cute 17. I was like an older brother to her. She wanted to sing. So I taught her how. The voice, the moves, that cute little smile. I taught her everything. And somewhere along the way, we fell in love. I married her. Four years later, she walked. What happened? Magic, Mr. Mason. Terry had magic when she sang. People couldn't take their eyes off her. And once she found that out, I couldn't hold her. Several of the people who were backstage at the auditorium the afternoon she was murdered told me you were there and that you were very upset with her. I was mad as hell. Three weeks before, Terry had called me and said, hey, why don't you be my guest at the concert? I said, great. I get to the door, there's no pass, my name's not on the guest list, and everybody backstage is treating me like dirt, even her. I felt like a complete fool. So, you were on speaking terms. Yeah, we kept in touch. I even went to her and Jack's wedding. Hey, why not? She's singing to 30,000 people at the auditorium. I'm singing feelings in some dive to a bunch of stiffs. You forgive and forget. I forgave. She forgot. And she wouldn't have amounted to a hill of beans if it hadn't been for you. Is that what you think? I know so. Not only did I teach her how to sing, I taught her how to use that body of hers to make people listen. some great moments did you know about her apartment on terrace drive i've been over there a few times the afternoon she was murdered you mean did she make me so mad that i went over there and killed her and then framed jack because i saw them fighting at the auditorium that's exactly what i mean nah forget it jack is the one that killed terry and like i told the da this morning terry called me a week earlier said that she was afraid that Jack was going to kill her. And lo and behold, he did. Excuse me. Thank you. I'll have a cup of clam chowder and a dinner salad with blue cheese. Then I'll have the lamb chops, you know, with the broccoli and a side of fries and a vanilla milkshake. I missed lunch. Number four cheeseburger and some fries, please. Where do you put it? <laughs> I expend a lot of energy on stage. I'm a singer. Oh. Actually, I think I expend more energy off stage 
worrying about making a fool of myself. <laughs> so, uh, Harry's a friend of yours? Yeah, more or less. He likes my voice, and he wants me to sing a couple of his songs on his next demo. That's terrific. So what's really terrific is that he wants me to quit my job and go to Vegas with us. He can get me work there. And in L.A., too. Sure he's got connections in the business? He's got you, right? Right. Which brings us to what I wanted to talk about. See, I listened to Harry's demo the other day, and I think I can use some of his stuff. He's really talented, isn't he? Oh, yeah. But the problem is, and <laughs> you're going to think I'm a flake here, he gave me his phone number and address, and I lost them. You know what they are? No, I don't. I'm sorry, I just... I never call him. He's always just hanging out at the club. You know his last name? Corcoran. Harry Corcoran. Actually, he'll probably be down at the club tonight. I'll be singing a whole set by myself. First time ever. <laughs> You'll be great. Why don't you come to Please? Okay. I'd like that. What about you, CJ? Let me guess. Perry Mason. I won't take long. So? What do you want? When and how did you, Terry, and Janice start singing together? We went to the same high school, started singing together there just for fun, drifted apart after graduation. Didn't even know Terry had gotten married till I ran into her after a divorce. She was a mess. Joe had been awful to her. He was so jealous of her he couldn't see straight. Anyway, the three of us started getting together and singing again. Terry had changed. She was much better. And pretty soon we realized we had something. And the dreams. How I need ya. Easy to love. I'm trying to be just. Easy to love. I know we can make it. Easy to love. So why don't you take it? Easy to love. She and I and Janice. We became best friends and stayed best friends. Until Terry decided to take over the spotlight, you mean? She says Sean Lasseter thought the group would be more commercial if it had a lead and two backups. So we became Terry Knight in the dreams. Did that make you angry? What do you think? Just what are you getting at? Rumor has it she wanted to fire you. I don't listen to rumors. What about opinions? I'm of the opinion that someone close to Terry may have arranged her murder. Just what the hell are you saying? That I had something to do with Terry's death? You started out as equals. You wanted to go back to being equals, didn't you? But she did not. Do something for me, okay, Mr. Mason? Go to hell. What I can't figure out is why so many people I talk to almost eulogize Terry. Maybe she was a nice person. She mistreated everybody around her, they all admit it. Yet in the same breath, they all go on about how wonderful she was. It doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. Thank you. Well, I checked every songwriter's organization, and not one of them has even heard of Harry Corcoran. There is no Harry Corcoran registered in any hotel or motel in the vicinity. Yeah, well, whatever his name is, he is an aspiring songwriter, because the people at the club have heard his demo tape. The more reason to believe that one of our suspects may have hired him, damn it. The more reason.
guy up in the booth that wants to talk to him, okay? Okay. Our men is something that Harry does every day. Okay. okay. The truth is, I work for the defense on a case that Harry's involved with. I need to talk to him. So, you weren't interested in me or my music? It's a murder case, Kathy, and Harry's involved up to his eyeballs. I wouldn't have lied to you unless it's absolutely imperative that I talk to this guy. Got to the point there wasn't anything more I could do to help her singing career, so she left me. So you were married to her for how many years? Just short of four full years. Prior to seeing her at the auditorium on the afternoon before she was murdered, when was the last time that you saw Ms. Knight? About a week before that. Under what circumstances? She called me, asked if she could come over. She sounded desperate, so I said, sure. So she came to see you? That afternoon. The minute she walked through the door, she started crying. Said I was the only one she could trust. Said she was afraid of her husband. She said why? His temper. She said it had gotten so bad that she was afraid that he was going to kill her. Those are exact words. No, actually not. Her exact words were, Joey, I'm scared of him. He loses his temper when we argue. One of these days, he's going to end up killing me. Nothing further. Your witness. Mr. Dillon, was anyone else present when you heard Terry Knight say she was afraid Jack Barnett was going to kill her? No, sir. And you remember her exact words. I have a very good memory, especially where Terry is concerned. 
Were you aware of anyone else who might benefit from Terry Knight's death? Not offhand, no. You're certain of that? Yeah. As certain as you are of Terry Knight's exact words? I suppose. Yes or no, Mr. Yes, Dick? I'm certain. What do you do for a living, Mr. Dillon? I sing and play piano in bars, at weddings, whatever. How much will you gross this week? 500 bucks. That for seven days? Six. How much would Terry Knight have grossed for three performances at the Denver Auditorium? $350,000. To the penny. Happen to know how much her estate is worth? A couple million, I guess. 14 million, to be exact. Now, who stood to inherit that money, Mr. Dillon? Probably Jack. That's right. Her husband, Jack. Except that if he were to be found guilty of her murder, he could not legally inherit one single cent. Everything would go to the second beneficiary named in her will. You know who that person is, Mr. Dillon? Now, wait a minute. Please, Mr. Dillon. Tell the court who the second beneficiary is. I don't know. Of course you know. It's you. If Jack Barnett is convicted of murdering his wife, then you will be handed a check for $14 million. Mr. Dillon, you lied just now about her will. Yet you expect us to believe you told the truth about Jack Barnett's threat against his wife. I think if we want the truth, this court will need someone's word other than yours. No further questions. But I'm telling the truth. Mr. Dillon, I Look, have no Everything that she said, she came and told me. Silence. Mr. Dillon, one more word from you and I will have to hold you in contempt, sir. Redirect. Uh, no, Your Honor. You may step down now. I'm looking for Kathy Redding. That's so normal. I almost didn't recognize you. Typist by day, rocker by night, huh? How did you find me? You're a bartender at the club. Go away. We gotta talk. Oh, great. So now, on top of everything else, you're gonna make me lose my job. What time do you get off work today? 5.30. 5.30 down in the lobby, okay? Okay. If you don't show up, I'll be back. I said okay. So I says to him, your wife doesn't want you going up there. And he says to me, mind your own business. And then he goes up. I couldn't stop him. I can't help but feel like what happened to Ms. Knight was my fault. Did Mr. Barnett seem angry to you? Real angry, yeah. When did Mr. Barnett leave the building? Do you remember? Not till that night, after the police came. You're sure? There's TV cameras all over that building. Anybody that comes in the front door or goes in and out the garage, I see him. Well, what if Mr. Barnett were driving someone else's car? Like Miss Knight's car? Now, I know everybody's car. Hers never left the building either. So what you're saying is, you did not see Mr. Barnett leave the building between 4 and 5 that afternoon. The time at which the coroner has testified, Ms. Knight was killed. No, I sure didn't. Thank you, Mr. Sussman. Your witness. Marvin Sussman. Those uh, TV monitors you mentioned, how many do you have to watch while you're on duty? Uh, let's see, there's uh, 10. 10? You watch 10 TV screens, Marmot? I should think that would be hard on your eyes. My eyes are as fit as fiddles. When's the last time you had them checked? About six months ago. 2020, both eyes. Don't your eyes get tired from looking at TV screens all day? No, sir. Don't you ever have to take a break, look away for a while? No, sir. They pay me to watch those monitors, and I do. Like a hawk. Well, thank you, Marvin. Oh. 
Who was Secretariat? <laughs> a racehorse. Swaps. Native dancer. Affirmed. All racehorses. Everybody knows that. Yankee Red. Yeah, he's a racehorse, too. But not everybody knows that. Only the people that bet on him in the feature race at Hialeah yesterday. People who like to play the horses. Now, you like to play the ponies, don't you, Marvin? I make a bet every once in a while. How often is once in a while? Marvin Sussman, I realize your job may very well be at stake here. But my client's life is at stake. Now, believe me, the guilt you feel for what happened to Terry Knight is nothing compared to what you'll feel if he's convicted because you failed to tell the truth. Now, you bet on the horses practically every day, don't you? Yeah. When you can't get to the track, how do you place your bets? I have a bookie. He works out of a bar that's just around the corner from the apartment building. Isn't it true that every day at 4.15 you go to that bar to place new bets and settle old ones with your bookie? Marvin, we need the truth now. Isn't that the truth? Yeah, it's true. Did you go to the bar the afternoon Terry Knight was murdered? Yes. How long were you gone? Fifteen minutes at the most. Isn't it true that during that time, Jack Barnett could have driven out of the building, gone to his office, and driven back into the building without your seeing him? Yeah, it's possible. Real possible. Thank you, sir. That's all. Go ahead, what would you like? Nothing. A cup of coffee. Well, maybe just a cup of decaf. And a beef stew. And a piece of pecan pie. A la mode. Well, you're not bleeding, so I guess you haven't found Harry yet. No, I haven't, but I found these. I finally got a good look at him at the club last night, so I went over to police headquarters to take a look at some mug shots. Guess what? He has a record, I know that. He told me. He wrote a couple of bad checks. Try armed robbery. Three years in Joliet, and his name isn't Harry Corcoran, it's Steve Gant. So big deal, so he changed his name because he... Wanted to start new with a clean slate. Kathy, I think this guy's a killer. He's just a songwriter. He's very dangerous. He likes my voice. Damn it, he thinks I'm good. Kathy, I know this guy said he wants to help you, and I know you want to believe him, but I'm telling you. It's bad news. <sighs> I'm staying at the Marketplace Hotel. Here's my number. Take it. If I'm wrong, throw it away. But if I'm right, Kathy, you gotta be careful. Give it to him. you get in here? The uh, window by the fire escape was open. You're lucky it was me and not some psychopath. <laughs> Excuse me. You don't seem very happy to see me. You broke into my home. I got tired of waiting outside. Where you been, anyway? Grocery shopping. What does it look like? And now I'm going to go change.
I want the money. Now. Nothing doing. Tomorrow night, or I start blowing whistles. Not there. The auditorium, seven o'clock. You'd better. Who was the guy at the club the other night? You're the one who beat him up. Why don't you tell me? There wasn't any A&R guy from Pacifica Records. That's what he said. What else did he say? Nothing. Hey, Harry! Harry! I think you're lying. He told me that you had been in prison for armed robbery. Okay? What else? Nothing. <laughs> you're lying again. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Harry, come on. He couldn't have known I did time unless he knew my real name. Okay, he told me that too. I just, I, I forgot, okay? Stay away from that guy, you hear me? You go near him again, and you got a problem with me. Mr. Clemens. Would you please tell this court your profession? I'm a lawyer. Most of my work is in the field of entertainment. You knew Terry Knight. I drew up the original contract between her, Carla Peters, and Janice White. I wanted to formalize their relationship as the dreams. And I continued as a lawyer right up until her death. So, you knew Terry Knight from, shall we say, her humble beginnings as a singer. From the grassroots, Mr. Mason. Mr. Clemens, fortune and fame, we know, can sometimes have strange effects on people. After achieving success, entertainers can sometimes become high-strung, demanding, unreasonable. Can they not? Objection. Where is the relevance? Your Honor, proof of reasonable doubt demands showing that other people, in this instance, a good many other people, had a motive for committing this murder. Terry Knight's personality is a crucial, crucial element. Your Honor, Mr. Mason is trying to put the victim on trial here. Perhaps, but there is some relevancy here. I'm going to overrule. Continue, Mr. Mason. Thank you, Your Honor. What about Terry Knight, Mr. Clemens? Did Terry Knight change too? I honestly thought that she might prove to be the exception to the rule. And for years, Terry was as kind and guileless as the day we met. Then about six months ago, well, she became just as imperious as any star I've ever known. Go on. Well, suddenly she was calling me every day, wanting this contract amended because so-and-so had ripped her off, wanting that contract nullified because so-and-so had lied to her. She even wanted to sue Carla Peters, her best friend. Apparently, Carla had talked to someone about cutting a solo album. Terry wanted to sue her for breach of contract. And her producer, Andy Sachs. Well, when he was mixing one of her albums, he accidentally lost a track she'd recorded. And she wanted to sue him for negligence. Fortunately, that didn't happen with Mr. Sachs or anyone else. This kind of litigation only serves to provoke people. And in the music business, making enemies of people you have to work with, well, that's something you must avoid. Thank you, Mr. Clemens. Karen, next Thursday night, a whole set to myself. Damn it. Save my brains out for it. <laughs> Congratulations. Get out of here, please. Why? Because if Harry sees me with you, there's going to be trouble all over again. Sounds like you've been talking to him. Look, I'm just trying to get on with my life. Would you leave me alone? I was right about leave it, wasn't I? Leave me out of it, Kathy, Harry? I don't want to make trouble for you, believe me. But two people are dead, and I'm pretty sure it's because of Harry. The only person that can help me nail him is you. Mr. 
Mason, will you call your next witness, please? Defense calls Carla Peters. Terry and Carla were friends. What are you doing? Trying to find the truth. <clears throat> Ms. Peters, when you, Janice Wyatt, and Terry Knight started out, it was just the dreams, was it not? That's right. But it ended up being Terry Knight and the dreams. Why? Why wasn't it Carla Peters and the dreams? It just didn't work out that way. When Sean Lassiter promoted Terry to lead singer and demoted you to backup, did Terry object? No. In fact, she was relieved she didn't have to compete with you anymore, wasn't she? I wouldn't know. In fact, when she heard you were thinking about doing a solo album, when it looked as though she would have to compete with you, she tried to destroy you, didn't she? Miss Peters, didn't Terry Knight try to sue you? She tried to sue me, yes. Terry Knight was a willful, vengeful star who was determined to crush any and all threats to her, including you. Isn't that true, Miss Peters? No, no, it isn't. You want me to sit up here and say Terry was some kind of monster, don't you? All I want is the truth. The truth? The truth is that she was one of the finest people who ever lived. You want me to say she changed? Okay. She changed. How can you not change when 40,000 people go nuts every time you step on stage? Well, you make so much money. You can buy anything you want. That's a lot for a girl who grew up with nothing, you know? People treated her like she was a superstar. So, okay, maybe she acted like one sometimes. But I knew what she was really like. She was my friend. And I loved her. No more questions. Is Tate Warner Cross? No, Your Honor. Witness may step down. Well, you got the truth. Any more brilliant ideas? Think of it this way, Jack. If we hadn't put Carla on the stand, we wouldn't have her truth, and we wouldn't have one less suspect.
Lieutenant Brock decided to join us. I understand you're on your way to pick up a paycheck. I don't understand what you're talking about. In fact, I think I'm being illegally detained here. You're under arrest for trespassing. How's that? And that's all I've got on him, gentlemen. Who's heading for the dressing room? Let's go, Lieutenant. money exactly how much was terry's life worth it wasn't me i'm doing this for someone else someone else made me do it who would that be your client jack barnett jack barnett did not give becky fifty thousand dollars to kill his wife well becky had to say something she probably figured that by laying it on Jack, she'd have the greatest effect on Brock. She was right. You think she's the one that hired that man to kill Terry? No. They were like sisters, according to Jack. The idea that she would kill Terry just doesn't make sense. Nothing about this case makes sense. So, what do we do now? Follow the money. Find out whose bank account that $50,000 came from. I gotta get a subpoena. Wait, Ken. Dell, I want you to call Jack and get him over here. And order some coffee. It's going to be a long night. You found any answers? No, just a theory. But it's the only way the fact that nothing makes sense makes sense. Mr. Leo, would you tell the court, please, who killed Terry Knight? A man named Steve Gant. How do you know that? Because I was the one who hired him to do it. I was forced to by her husband, Jack Barnett. Order. Order. He came to me about a month before the murder and told me if I didn't do as he said, he'd ruin me. He'd make sure no one in the music business would ever hire me again. How did you find Steve Gant? Run an ad in the paper? I knew him because he was a songwriter. At least he thought he was. He, he kept writing stuff for Terry on spec and begging me to give it to her. Kept trying to butter me up. He let it slip once that he'd been in prison. So I assumed correctly that he was capable of violence. How much did you agree to pay him? 50000 before and 50000 after. Cash. Again, it was Jack's idea. Not quite. You see, the money tells a different story. $100,000 is a lot of cash. The withdrawals Jack Barnett made over the past eight weeks, even over the past year, add up to nowhere near $100,000. The records are right there. Now, where did Jack Barnett get the money? People in the music business are always making cash deals. He probably had it squirreled away in some safe deposit box. I have the bank records here to show that someone did make cash withdrawals, which add up to $100,000. Now, Terry Knight and Jack Barnett had one joint bank account and each had several separate accounts, did they not? Yes. Who handled Terry's account? I did, most of the time. Now... What happened to the cash that was withdrawn from three of her accounts on eight different occasions? Withdrawals which, as you can see, add up to $100,000. I don't know. Terry was very impulsive. Sometimes when she felt like buying something, she'd just go to the bank, get some cash, buy it, and tell me about it later. How do you suppose Steve Gant got into Terry's apartment so he could do the killing? I don't know. I didn't either. So I asked him. He said the door was unlocked. Now, how do you suppose that happened? Jack unlocked it for him and then left on a fake errand so it would look like he had an alibi. Jack 
said it was locked when he left to run that errand. He said he and Terry always kept the door locked. He's lying. He is. Isn't it possible that someone unlocked it after Jack Barnett left? If you're suggesting it was me, I was at the auditorium. You can ask anybody. No, it wasn't you. It was the only person it could have been. It was Terry Knight herself. Objection. This is all speculation. Overruled. After the liquor, the painkillers, the sleeping tablets, Terry made one great desperate effort to unlock the door so a stranger could end her suffering with a bullet. She wanted to die, didn't she? But she couldn't kill herself. No. Miss DeLeo. Is it not true that in the seven months prior to her death, you and Terry Knight made several trips to Sloan Kettering Hospital in New York City? No. Yes. Would you tell the court, please, who is Dr. Philip Daltrey? An oncologist on staff there. And who is Dr. Marla Scott? A neurosurgeon. Why was Terry Knight seeing those doctors? Why? <sighs> Becky, aren't you going to tell us about your best friend? She had a brain tumor. And the doctors told her the tumor was inoperable. Yes. They told her her personality would change. And that her behavior would become erratic. And that gradually she'd lose control physically until finally... It was going to be horrible. So you helped her plan and carry out her own death. I loved her. She wanted people to remember her as she really was. Not as this awful thing she was turning into. And she told me if I didn't help her, she'd just keep trying until she found someone who would. Originally, Gant planned it to look like she came upon a burglar and was killed. Why did you change the plan to make it look like premeditated murder? Why did you frame her husband? I hated him. He hurt her so badly, I hated him. I couldn't stand the thought that she had to die all alone. Well, he got to go on living and enjoying everything she'd helped him get. But he loved her, honestly and deeply. Nobody loved her like I did. She was out of her mind with pain. She begged me to help her. She was my friend. What else could I do? Nobody loved her like I did. <laughs> Your Honor, in view of these revelations, I move that all charges against the defendant be dismissed. Does the state object? No, Your Honor. So ordered. The bailiff will take Miss DeLeo into immediate custody. Case dismissed. Sure, 
don't want to join us. Very good. <laughs> I'll ask Perry. I hope you can make it. We'll try. Jack, how about dinner with us tonight? I know a place where the music is soft, dancing is slow, and I know the words to the songs. I don't think I'd be very good company tonight. Oh. You know Cherry wasn't herself. I know. I just feel bad for her, that's all. Oh, Perry, uh, Ken just invited us to the club where Kathy Redding is performing. You accepted? <laughs> I know what you think about rock and roll. Is she trying to make me sound like I'm not with it? I would hope not. How about some dinner? Oh, I already asked him. He said he'd rather not. Perry, thanks for everything. Yeah.